case study, Adolf Hitler. Early background. Adolf Hitler was born in Brana M. N. in the Austro-Hungarian Empire on April 20th, 1889. His father, Alois Schickelgruber Hitler, had been born to an Austrian domestic servant named Maria Schickelgruber and a wealthy Jewish man only identified by the last name Frankenberger. According to the public records, Frankenberger had paid Maria child support money until Alloy was 14 years old. Maria Schickelgruber later married a mill worker by the name of Johann George Heidler, or Hitler in German, who refused to take care of Alloy. Johann's brother, a farmer, raised Alloy instead. In 1876, when Alloy was 39, he persuaded Johann to change the name on his baptismal records from Schickelgruber to Hitler in the courts. Alloy worked as a border patrolman for the Austro-Hungarian Customs Police. Adolf's mother, Clara Polzel, was Alloy's third wife and his 22-year-old younger second cousin. Adolf grew up with four siblings in a two-bedroom hovel in the town of Linz in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Only one of his siblings was biologically related in full, Paula. Three of the Hitler children died young. Childhood and Adolescence Adolf grew up with a physically and emotionally abusive household. His father, Alloy, was a violent alcoholic with an authoritarian approach to discipline. He beat his children with a hippopotamus whip on a regular basis. And if you don't know what a hippopotamus whip is, I suggest you Google it. It's, uh, it's a very nasty instrument that's used to basically whip beasts of burden. Alloy once beat young Adolf to the point of give, going unconscious. He not only beat the dog until it once urinated on the floor, he also would call to Hitler with the same whistle he would use basically with the dog. Clara was also beaten in front of Adolf and his siblings. A Adolf loved his mother and <clears throat> looked at her as his sole source of security and stability in what was otherwise a stable, unpredictable environment. Um, she was, as far as what we call in self-psychology, his idealized self-object. According to Silverstein, the ideal idealized self-object, or parental imago, or adult attachment figure is looked upon by a young child in a role that is all-powerful and all-knowing and one who can aid the child in calming and self-soothing. Idealization is a normal stage in childhood development and can lead to a healthy, cohesive sense of self if the parent-child attachment dyad is secure and stable. Over time, the healthy child will grow out of the archaic idealized self-object period However, children who grow up in environments with abuse and neglect can age long past a point when having an idealized self-object is, is useful and it can actually cause problems. According to Silverstein, disturbances to the period of self-object idealization may lead to the person seeking subsequent romantic attachments whereby his or her idealized self-object is projected on the object of affection. The idealized object of affection is viewed as being omnipotent and perfect, like the archaic idealized parental imago, or parental attachment figure, and therefore a way for the person to feel stable, secure, and an increased self-esteem. Adolf, who viewed his mother as the model of omnipotence and the quint quintessential Aryan woman, uh, throughout his life, uh, his subconscious projected this idealized object onto women with whom he was sexually attracted. Conversely, his father became the source of his hatred. Adolf developed an Oedipal conflict with his parents, whereby he subconsciously wanted to kill his violent drunken father so he could receive uninterrupted love and attention from his mother. As Adolf grew older and into adolescence, he learned how not to cry while being beaten and to channel his violent hatred toward Alloy by rebelling against his rules and expectations especially in school. However, he would continue to have psychosexual conflicts, feelings of persecution, and pent-up hostility. It is uncertain when Adolf found out that his father was half-Jewish. He officially found out about his grandmother Maria having his father with the Jewish man Frankenberger 
uh, through his attorney Hans Frank in 1930. It is likely that he learned about his father's questionable origins earlier. Just as Adolf unconsciously assigned his enabling mother the idealized parental imago, he assigned his father with all the associated traits of the other. Whenever he first discovered that his father was of Jewish descent, he, desi he assigned him subconsciously to the status of Jews who were, who were historically regarded with hatred by Gentile Germans. Adolf was reported by his brothers and teachers as being, bright, being a bright student, but with an unstable temperament that led to volatile anger. The only classes that he excelled in were art and German history. His secondary school German history teacher, Dr. Leopold Potsch, inspired him with a rousing, romanticized history of the Germanic people. It was Dr. Potsch's class that started Adolf's attraction towards uh, long-term involvement in right-wing German nationalist and anti-Semitic circles, as well as channeling his unaddressed psychosexual deficits into his political and ideological views. Silverstein explained that self-objects don't have to be persons in order to bring self-cohesion. Rather, they can be political or philosophical beliefs that can bring psychological self-cohesion. <clears throat> in, in Adolf's case, <clears throat> his unresolved psychosexual deficits with the idealized parental imago of his mother uh, channeled his subconscious sexual aggression through the ideology of Nazism. Alloyd died when Adolf was 13. Though Clara encouraged him to apply for a civil service job like his father, he refused. His rebelliousness in included anti-religious sentiments, which he acted on by challenging his theology teacher and writing a vulgar version of the story about the Immaculate Conception. Adolf dropped out of high school at the age of 14 after contracting a respiratory inf infection that kept him out of school for a significant amount of time. Instead of returning to school after he recovered, he dropped out. Believing himself to be an artistic genius, he spent his days in isolation painting. Adulthood. Adolf continued to live with his mother, Clara, until she died in 1907. Following her death, he moved to Vienna to pursue an art career. He applied to get into the Academy of Fine Arts twice, but was rejected. The first time he failed, Adolf's drawings were not up to the caliber of talent that the Academy sought from candidates. The second time, he was told by the professor who saw his sample to pursue a trade instead. He blamed his failure on being accepted in the Academy on there being four Jewish members on the school's admissions panel. Blame for failures and projecting feelings of inferiority on others, in particular Jews, was a common psychological tactic of adults in order to preserve his fragile self-esteem. He soon ran out of the little money he had after moving to Vienna and became homeless. He drifted, slept in the parks, and panhandled until he was able to get enough money to stay in a rooming house. Adolf worked menial jobs and sometimes sold paintings he made. His fellow residents at his rooming house described him as antisocial and hostile. Many of his fellow boarders wanted him kicked out. Fortunately, a fellow boarder, an artist named Joseph Greiner, intervened. Greiner would become the closest thing to a friend of Adolf's during his years living in Vienna. Joseph enlisted Adolf to help him with artwork he was commissioned to produce for advertising. During one of their collaborative projects for a lingerie ad, Adolf became infatuated with a 17-year-old model who had been hired to pose. To him, she represented the idealized self-object of his mother, Clara. Uh, she was not only an example of what he regarded as Aryan beauty, but an object through which he could receive comfort and validation. When the model refused to undress in front of him and rejected and mocked his romantic overtures to relax her, by quoting poetry, he physically attacked her. Joseph pulled him off of her, uh, kicking and screaming and biting and scratching her. Joseph was able to persuade her not to press charges, yet when Adolf later found out that the model was engaged to a young businessman of half-Jewish half extraction, his anger over his rejection by her turned to rage. He vented to Joseph about how Jews were filthy swine and even though the model's fiancé had been baptized a Christian, no water or priest could turn a Jew into an Aryan. Adolf subsequently wrote a letter to the model's fiancé. He claimed that he was a girl's lover 
and that he would not give her up to a dirty pig. He made a couple of attempts to confront them in public. The second attempt was at their wedding, from which he was ejected by hired security. Adolf's obsessive anger over having been rejected is referred to by Kohut as nar narcissistic rage. <clears throat> Narciss narcissistic rage occurs when a person is rejected and or blocked from affirmation by another person who represents the former's idealized self-object. Adolf felt the same pain he experienced as a child when his mother, Clara, was una unable to meet his attachment needs. Conversely, the model's half-Jewish fiancé, like his father, represented everything he loathed and despised about Alloy and the Jewish part of himself. The rejection threatened Adolf with possible ego disillusion, which he prevented through rage. He swore off women for a while after the incident with the model. Adolf later compared Jews to parasites and carriers of disease. Gilbert pointed out that his feelings of disgust and nausea from encountering Jews was a symptom of his unresolved psychosexual issues regarding his father, which manifested psychosomatically as physical illness. It was this psychophysiological reaction that reinforced his beliefs that Jews spread disease and were parasites on the nation. Adolf remained in Vienna until 1912 when he moved to Munich, Germany. He continued his aimlessness until 1914 when the First World War broke out. According to his book Mein Kampf, he was not ashamed to say that even today that I, I sank to my knees, overcome by a passionate inspiration, and thanked heaven with an overflowing heart for having granted me the good fortune of being alive at this time. This statement represents his romanticized nationalistic beliefs on both his, con his conscious and subconscious levels. On a conscious level, he was looking for meaning and, and purpose for his life after experiencing a years-long identity crisis following his rejection from Art Academy. Um, enlisting in the German army and serving for the fatherland in World War I filled the void of his subconscious mind over having no secure attachments with his father. Adolf had disavowed any self-object that represented alloy. Uh, he therefore had a deficit with regard to his male psychodevelopmental milestones that would otherwise have been reached with a stable, nurturing paternal authority. Joining the military and fighting for Germany filled the subconscious void by giving Adolf the chance to be a part of something greater than himself, or in other words, German nationalism. World War I and right-wing activities. Adolf had already been rejected for compulsory military service for Austria-Hungary after being deemed unfit for combat. Declaration of war for Germany would mean that he would overcome the vulnerable role of his ego while reinforcing the grandiose one. During the war, he was awarded the Iron Cross and promoted to rank of corporal. In October of 1918, Adolf was gassed during an attack by the British. He was still convalescing in the hospital when the war ended. Um, I could easily see with his personality that there was some guilt there over not having been in the rest of the combat and um, that adding to his anger over Germany lo losing the war. Uh, in his case, uh, Adolf returned um, to a country that had been defeated and demoralized, um, personally returned to Munich, poverty and obscurity. As his first post-war job, Adolf became an intelligence agent for the German District Army Command. His job at this time was basically to spy on all right-wing and left-wing groups and report to the military because um, there was concerns over the economic stability, instability excuse me, um, after the collapse of the German Empire that it could either turn into um, a communist revolution or some kind of right-wing dictatorship. He gave a lot of speeches at this time um, to military veterans like himself about how Germany had been stabbed in the back by the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy with the Versailles Treaty's unfair terms. Um, now the terms of the Versailles Treaty, um, which put economic and military stipulations on Germany, were extremely unfair. Um, Germany had not started the war, actually. It was Austria-Hungary. They were only helping their ally, and they were 
defeated, therefore they're punished. However, um, the Weimar Republic was considered an alien government and Jewish people were considered aliens, not actual Germans. And so there was an association that during the German Revolution in which the Kaiser fled Germany and um, a lot of leftists took over and founded the Weimar Republic, that there was a conspiracy um, by Jews and Bolsheviks um, out of Soviet Russia to, uh, to basically ensure the final defeat of Germany in the war. None of this was true, but it was an explanation that appealed to Germans across various demographics. Um, political agitation over the nation's impoverishment and inflation came from both the left and the right. Adolf's agent provocation exposed him to various left-wing and right-wing circles. It was from this milieu that he joined a socialist party with nationalist leanings called the German Workers' Party, or the DAP, in 1919. The DAP, later to be renamed the NSDAP, or National Socialist German Workers' Party, didn't spread anti-Semitism in Germany first. In fact, anti-Semitism had had a second win when the Jews were starting to move out of the ghettos in the late 1700s and early 1800s, um, after the Enlightenment and after the Revolutionary Wars um, between French revolutionaries and their Confederates against these traditional governments. So anti-Semitism kind of had a comeback as Jews were becoming more assimilated into Gentile societies in Europe. Uh, an example of the anti-Semitism in the 1800s, um, almost 1900s, was the Dreyfus Affair in 1894 France. In Germany at the end of World War I, there were numerous groups preaching anti-Semitism like the occultist Thule Society and Vril Society. Um, the Nazi Party, uh, which had been founded in 1919, originally as the German Workers' Party by Anton Drexler and Gottfried Feeder, had already had an anti-Semitic plank in the platform of the party when Adolf joined. According to Gilbert, who interviewed Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg, like Hermann Goering and Alfred Rosenberg, the anti-Semitic plank had been added to the DAP platform in response to the short-lived Bavarian Soviet Republic, which had been led by Jewish um, communist activists. Ad Adolf's membership in the DAP became a perfect fit to share his narcissistic psychopathology. Soon after joining, Adolf changed the DAP to the NSDAP, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, 